Hi, this is Loki from Beta Folders. In this video, we'll take a look at how to use an external editor to work with recipes in Folded. We'll look at how to share recipes with others, and we'll look at the best practices for updating a shared recipe. To get started, we'll open the Folded Cookbook and click on this notepad icon to open the recipe head. That gives us a blank screen here. We want to check up here at the top that it says Script V2. That's for scripts that are written in the Lua, which is L-U-A, programming language. It may also say GUI up at the top. And those are the older GUI scripts that rely on this fixed set of commands. That's not what we'll be talking about today. So if it says GUI at the top, all you have to do is click New Script V2 down here at the bottom. And the Folded Recipe Editor is an editor, and you can use it to edit your recipes and write a very simple recipe in here and run that recipe and look at your output window. It says hello, so you can do that much, but this is a very limited editor. It doesn't have any undo capabilities. It doesn't have any keyword highlighting capabilities. It doesn't have any indenting capabilities. So uh, most programmers are going to prefer not to use this editor, but to use an external editor instead. In the Windows environment, you can always start with Notepad, which is what I've done here. And that does have undo, but it Still doesn't have a lot of things that are found in a programming editor, but it's free and good enough to get started. One way to do this is to highlight everything in the recipe, and I can just do Control-A to select everything. And then I can do Control-C to copy it, or go up here to Edit Copy. And then I can go back to the Folded Recipe Editor, and there's no Paste button or anything like that, but I happen to know that Control-V will cause my recipe to be pasted into the editor here. And one issue you see right away is that there are these little square boxes at the end of the line, and, and that has to do with the transition from the carriage return line feed that's used in Windows to the line feed only that's used in Foldit and many other environments. These little square boxes won't actually cause any problem. We can just go ahead and run the recipe, and it says there are 71 segments in my protein. And if I go up here, and I think that's my last segment, I'll uh, tab on that, and it says 71. So it looks like my recipe is working at this point. There's also a file called script log, and that's going to be called scriptlog.default.xml if you're working in the default track, or uh, otherwise the uh, default part is changed to whatever the name of your track is. And I'll load in that, that file and see what we just ran. Okay, so I see the, the same output here that I see in my folded client in, in the recipe output window. That's wrapped up in a lot of uh, XML tags here. There's a script name, a script description, a macro ID, and a macro revision ID. And we'll see how those work in just a minute. Let's go back to the uh, folded client one more time. I actually don't see my recipe at this point, but if I click the Open Recipe Editor icon again, it's still there. So what I want to do is save this recipe. Whenever I create a new recipe, I like to give it a title that includes a version number. And that cuts down on confusion. We'll look at that more in a minute as well. So let's call this Mokai's new recipe V10. Okay, and, and the description field is the required field, and so we'll say count the segments. Okay, that's been saved, and now if we close this again, we can see that there's an entry for that recipe in the cookbook now, and we can get to the recipe editor by clicking on the uh, edit recipe icon. And so there it is again. So now we can uh, share the recipe, and you can share the recipe with public, which will share it with all Foldit users. You can share it with users in your group only, or you can share it with yourself, and that, that's handy if you're using multiple computers or multiple clients. It lets you move recipes around easily. So I'll click share with me for this one. And now there's a, a web link right down here in the recipe editor, or you can go to the Foldit website, go to recipes. That'll show you all the public recipes with the newest recipes listed first. Now I've shared with myself, so I'll go to self-shared recipes. Okay, and there's the entry for my new recipe. Okay, so it has its own web page. And one of the things you'll notice here is that the, this recipe has a recipe ID now. And that's basically the, the URL for the recipe. So now let's look at the effect that that has on the script log. So we'll go back to fold it here. We'll, we'll run this one more time. The output looks the same here. Let's open up the script log file. And my editor is telling me that this has changed. So now we can see that the script name and the script description has been filled in. It now has that macro ID, basically the same as the uh, URL for the recipe. Find the web page for the recipe from that, 101902. And there's also a macro revision ID in here, so that's 202562. We'll remember that. Okay, let's go back to the folded client, open up our recipe editor, still on the same page here. Now let's let's say I want to fix these little square boxes. Now I do have the option of going control A, control C here, and then I could go back to notepad and paste that in, and it looks the same. Well, that's obviously not going to fix the little square box issues. I'm going to need a, a different editor to do that. What you can do instead here is go to Save As, 
And uh, under Save As, there's an Export button. And th this will actually let you export the recipe to a file on your computer, and then you can work with that file using whatever editor you'd like to work with. So to do that, the first thing that I like to do is go up here to the recipe title, go Control A, Control C again to copy that recipe title, and then I'll click Export. Now that takes me to a folder that I've created for recipes, so it's Documents, Folded, Recipes. And the first thing I'd like to do here is create a new folder, either with this New Folder button up here, or I can right-click, select New, and Folder. So either path gets you there. And then I'll paste in the name of the recipe, but I'll, I'll remove the revision ID for the name of the folder. I'll navigate to that folder, pull it recipes, localize new recipe, and then down here under file name, I'll paste in the recipe name again. I'll leave the version information there, and I'll add the file extension .lua. And that file extension is important. It lets many text editors know which programming language you're using. And so they'll load in the correct profile and highlight all the keywords. And that's a big time save. Okay, so I've saved that macro file. Now I'll go to Windows Explorer, and I'll, I see the folder that I just created, and there's the recipe I just created. I've set this up to use the uh, Vim editor, and the, the big advantage of this is that uh, you can work with it without removing your hands from the keyboard. Now you can see right here that the little square boxes appear in Vim as this Control M sequence. I want to get rid of that, and I happen to know the way to do that is to copy one of them, and then we'll go down here to open up a command line, and we'll enter a wonderful user-friendly Unix-style command. Okay, and that, that has replaced all the Control M's, actually deleted them, so that looks good to me. So now I've, I've changed this recipe. Technically, this is a new version. Now let's see what happens when we don't change the version ID or anything else. So I'm just going to write this out. We'll go back to the uh, folded recipe editor. Previously, we did save as export. Now we can do the inverse of that. We can do load and import. Okay, so that takes me back to the same folder I was just in. And I see my modified recipe here. I'll open that up. And there it is. The uh, little square boxes have disappeared. I'll give it a run just to make sure. Okay, the output still looks good. Now let's look at our script log file at this point. We've made a change. Let's see what that looks like. So here it was before. We had this macro revision ID of 202.562. Let's reload this file and see if this looks any different. No, no change so far. So still 202.562. We'll remember that number. Now we're going to uh, go back to the recipe editor. We'll save this file. And it already has a description, a title, and I haven't changed either of those, so it just lets me save it. Let's run it one more time. Let's look at the uh, script log file. My editor is now telling me that it's changed. Let's load that in. So now, one subtle change here is that the macro ID remains the same, but the macro revision ID is now zero. What that's telling me is that I've made a change to the recipe locally, but that recipe has not been shared with anybody. So now let's go ahead and share this recipe again, and I'll, I'll just share with me again. So let's go back to the website now, and okay, let's notice our, our times here. So this was created at 1327, updated at 2127. That's just a little uh, bug, perhaps, or feature might be a better term for it, of the, uh, the website is, is that there will always be this uh, gap between the created at and updated on time. Now I've actually updated this, but I, I'll hit reload up here, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so where the time was 21.27, now it's 21.35, and the uh, created at time has not changed. So that's one clue that something has changed, but the problem that you'll see here is that there are no other clues. So nothing tells the user that there was a, a previous version of this recipe. So now you have a situation where some users may have downloaded the original version of your recipe, and some users may get this new version of your recipe, and it's very hard to tell them apart. So they get different results. It's difficult to distinguish uh, who has what version. Well, let's go back to the uh, folded client. Now that we've shared this out, let's run it yet again. And let's look at our good old script log file. So my, my editor is again telling me that this has changed. And where the macro revision ID went to zero before, we'll load it again. Okay, now the macro revision ID is at 202.563. So that's one indication that there, there's, there's been a change to this recipe. But unfortunately, this, this macro ID and the macro revision ID uh, don't appear anywhere in the folded recipe editor. The macro ID itself, of course, does appear here on the, on the website, but the macro revision ID does not. So this is not a very good way to keep people from getting confused, and it's easy enough for people to get confused. So that raises the question of what's the best way to go about changing a recipe. Here's the way that I do it. First of all, we'll go back to Windows Explorer, and we'll, we'll take the recipe that we, we're, we're starting out with, and we'll just make a new copy. 
To do that, I select the recipe, right click, drag it down here, and select copy here. Okay, so that creates a new file with the word copy in it. And I'll just rename that file. Okay, now since I've set my Vim editor to work with .lua files, I'll just double click the file there and it opens up my editor. So the first thing I'd like to do here is change the version number and I'll, I'll write the file out right away. And then I'll go ahead and make whatever my change is. That might be something as simple as just adding a bit of program. So we'll just add a little for loop here and we'll basically count to 10. Okay, so not much of a programming change, but that's how you do it. You can write that out. Now let's see how we get that change into Foldit to run it and uh, to share it with others. One way you could do that is click on the recipe editor icon here and just start a new recipe and go through the steps that we did before. But what I, I like to do is preserve the history of the recipe. So I'm going to edit the existing recipe and I'll do save as here. And instead of exporting, I'll give the recipe a new title and the only change to the title is the version number in this case. And I'll give it a new description. Okay, and then I'll just save that. So now I've, I've saved the original recipe, and I'll have a second entry in my cookbook. And so what I want to do is edit that second entry, and once again use load, import, and we'll take in the new version of the recipe, and we'll see it has the loop counter here. We'll try running it just to be sure. And so now it counts the segments and counts to 10. So we'll edit that recipe once again. You'll notice that there's a little changed indicator up here, a little asterisk up on the title bar. So we'll say save, and that's gone away. And then we'll say share. Once again, we'll share with me. Okay, my recipe has been shared. So now I'll go back to the website again. Let's uh, take a look at our times, 1327 and 2135. So we'll reload the original recipe. Okay, so the times haven't changed there. Oh, but we do have a, a link to a child recipe now. So let's go to that. Okay, so brand new child recipe. Once again, you'll observe that there's an offset of uh, several hours between the created time and the updated time. But uh, there's our new recipe. This will also link back to the original recipe. And if I go up to recipes and look at self-shared recipes again, I'll see both versions of the recipe here. So th this approach of always giving a recipe a new title makes it a lot less confusing for your users. And if anybody prefers to use version 1.0 of the recipe, they can just go and, and get it from the website. There, there, there's no uh, question about the behavior of the recipe depending on when you've downloaded. So basically I treat any, anything that's been shared as read-only and that, that never gets updated. And if I want to change anything, I'm going to give it a new title and uh, share it out under that new title, uh, preserving the link between parent and child. So if we open up the script log file and reload it once again, we can see that there is a new macro ID in here, 101.903. And if we go back to the Foldit website with a new recipe, you see 101.903. That's the basics of how to work with a recipe. Once again, to get a recipe to disk, I prefer to use save as and then export to export it to a file. And, and when I create a recipe file, I use the extension .lua and that, that tells my editor to load the Lua language profile. And then to uh, bring a modified recipe back into Foldit, I use load import, select the recipe in there and load it in. Whenever I make a change to a recipe, I first copy the recipe to a new file, make my changes there. Then I copy the recipe in the Foldit cookbook, giving it a new title there. Then I import the modified recipe under that new title before sharing. This procedure cuts down on confusion and preserves the modification history of your recipe. So that's it for today. Hope this helps and keep on folding.